part two of a sermon series entitled, The Gospel Unmasked. As many of you might know, I have the privilege of driving with one of the zone supervisors of the Clay County Sheriff's Department. His name is Eric Twisdale. And Eric and I have become pretty good friends. I think this is my fifth, fourth or fifth time going out with uh, Sergeant Twisdale. And this past Wednesday, he picked me up around about 10.30, and off we went, driving the streets of Clay County. Now, I don't even think that the regular non-church-going people of Clay County knows what goes on on their streets. But I think that us church-going folk have even less of an idea of what goes on on the streets of our very own county. At 12.07 a.m., there was a drug bust just outside Home Depot and the Target stores on Wells Road. Sergeant Twisdale leaned over and he showed me 21 sachets of cocaine. And in each sachet, there's four or five hits. I wasn't able to, to count them. And each hit goes for 30 or 40 dollars. They seized the vehicles and they, they pulled over three young people, two young girls and a young guy in separate vehicles. My heart ached as I saw those young girls sitting in the back of the police car, arrested and cuffed and ready for their journey to the Clay County Jail. At 12.42, there was a complaint from the Hooters restaurant that there was an altercation with a drunk client. As we arrive, the suspect flees in his van. He ramps over the curbs, gets out the exit onto Wells Road, ramps over the median, and makes his way into a subdivision. Well, Sergeant Twisdale is way ahead of the game. He had already called two of his deputies to block off access, and the van couldn't go any further. Get out the car, shouts Sergeant Twisdale, and the suspect refuses to get out. Well, needless to say, he was helped out of the vehicle onto the ground, hands behind his back, cuffed and apprehended. But my heart ached as this out-of-control, totally drunk person starts crying, and as they say in, in Dutch, he goes into drunk verdriet, which is like drunken blues, <laughs> and starts crying, calling on the name of Jesus. Well, Sergeant Twisdale calls me over and he says, he's calling Jesus, do you want to come and talk to him? So I get out of the vehicle, and he looks at me kind of in this blurry stupor, and he says, you're a pastor. You don't look like a pastor to me. It is funny, but at the same time, it's absolutely heartbreaking. What led up to that point where that gentleman was too out of his wits to even know, to just wait and resolve what could have been amicable reconciliation between him and the Hooters restaurant. At 2.13 a.m., a dispatcher alerts of an erratic driver near Blanding and Nightbox Road. Two trucks are pulled over because they are racing from light to light down Blanding at 2 o'clock in the morning. And so I'm sure, as I, as I could very well tell you all the stories about house fires because of neglect and drug abuse, I could tell you about the young man that I picked up off the streets, whom I went to try and find on Wednesday night, and there was no trace of him on the streets because he's gone back. 
the heartbreaking stories of a sin-infected world with a venom of sin that is so toxic and so hypnotic that man doesn't even realize he's infected. And we know the, we know the story so well. Indeed, the world has been poisoned by the venom of sin. And indeed, the world needs an antidote, an anti-venom against this, this debilitating, toxic venom that hypnotizes man into a state of not even knowing where he is, what he's doing, or the danger that he is in. And we ask ourselves the question as good church folk, do we even realize that we are infected? Do we even realize the danger we are in? Do we even realize that at times we are in a hypnotic stupor, not realizing what the priorities of our Christian life really is? And we know the story all too well, and yes, there is the serpent, and we know the story of how our mother, Eve, was hypnotized, and how she fell to the lies. You see, Satan lies, and that is his ploy to infect us. Then the serpent sent to the woman in Genesis 3, 4, and 5, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil." A blatant lie told to her. You see, Satan's lies infected our parents, Adam and Eve, and as a result came fear, shame, blame, guilt, and separation. Separation from God and separation from one another. But my friends, in the very moment that that infection took place, guess what happened? God immediately rushed in with the antidote. He was right on the scene. He was there, and He gave them exactly what they needed to withstand the effects of this toxic poison called sin. He said to them, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, he says to the serpent, and you shall bruise his heel. God comes in immediately and he says to Adam and Eve, you will not be under the spell of this serpent. I will put separation between you. And I went on to uh, theosaurus.com and I looked at what enmity actually means. Um, it means alienation, antagonism, and it's got all these synonyms of what enmity means, but basically it's, it's, it's like a, a little mini war between the two. God will not allow the enemy to have hold upon his children. And so, if we had to go through and have a look at what this antidote entails, God's perfect antidote says immediately, he proclaims the good news, I will put enmity between you and the woman. My friends, that enmity comes in the form of Jesus Christ, who came and took on our natures, our fallen sinful natures, and he lived the perfect life, and he paid the penalty for sin. And as a result, broke the power that the enemy had upon this world, and enmity was put between man and the serpent. Sin's hold is broken. So God rushes in with the good news, 
And he says, sin will not have a hold over you. And this is the beautiful scripture that I'd like to call our scripture reading. It says, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through what? Through the gospel. Jesus Christ put enmity between the enemy and his children. And he abolishes death. Do you know, just recently I was asked to do a funeral for one of non-members of, of the community. And the hope that I was able to deliver to that family. She came to me afterwards and she said, I'm so excited. It's not a goodbye. It's just a see you later. I know I will see him again. And so Jesus has abolished death and he has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. My friends, the gospel, the gospel is what brings enmity between us and the enemy. The gospel brings hope, it brings healing, it brings relief, it brings peace, and it brings restoration. The gospel is the antidote. And it seems like as we uh, transfer from computer to computer, we get a little bit of a clash here, but we won't worry about that. I'll tell you exactly what that is. In the second panel now, so the first panel, we've got the good news. God rushes in, he gives the good news. It's okay, Adam and Eve, Satan will not have power over you. In the second thing, he now, he breaks the power of, of the serpent and he says, you will bruise his head. So the serpent's power is broken. You see, the same method of deception, the same logic that he used to deceive the holy pair in Eden, he has used in all succeeding ages. And what is that? To tell lies. His plan of work has ever been one of deception. Think about anything that you've ever done wrong. What lies behind it? A lie. The enemy lies to you and says, you're going to feel good if you do this. The enemy lies to you and he says, if you react to that person, you are justified. Or this conflict will never be resolved. The enemy comes with these little insidious lies and that's his only power over us is lies. But the power of the enemy is broken. We we bruise his head when we hold on to the truth. And so the gospel is the antidote. In the last panel there, God then comes and he relieves the effects of sin. Okay, what does he do first? He rushes in and he tells them good news. He gives them hope. I'll put enmity between you. I'll separate. The second thing he does is he says, the enemy doesn't have power over you. His power is broken. You will bruise his head. Because the only power that he has is to tell lies. But I'm telling you the truth now. The third thing is he does, he, he relieves the effects of sin. What does God do? He comes and he helps them. They shame, they're naked. They've got little fig leaves stuck in precarious little places. And he says, no. God makes garments of skin for them. And I, the Bible doesn't tell us this, but you can just imagine God going and slaying a lamb or two and taking the skin off and then demonstrating the sacrificial system to them and saying, here's the foreshadowing. Here's the life of Christ. That's how it's going to unfold. It's going to foreshadow the ultimate payment of the penalty. And then he takes the skins and he shows them how to make clothes. He meets their needs in that state. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that grace? And so, fast forward all the way through the Old Testament. 
right up until when Jesus comes. Jesus is to administer God's perfect antidote through his life and his teaching. Do you remember Luke 4, verse 18, where Jesus stands up in the synagogue? They give him the book of Isaiah to read out of, and he reads out of chapter 61. In those days, there weren't chapters, but this is what he reads. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Can you see a little bit of a parallel between what God did with Adam and Eve? If you don't, let's have a look at it. All right. So how does Jesus continue with those three items that God put together? Well, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has appointed me to preach good news to the poor. What did God do? He rushed in with good news. He reassured Adam and Eve, I will put enmity between you. Jesus comes and He preaches good news to the poor, number one. Number two, He proclaims liberty to the captives. Which captives are they? The ones that the enemy has been able to ensnare. He preaches liberty to the captives and sets at liberty those who are oppressed. He breaks the power of the enemy. Number three, he relieves the effects of sin by healing the brokenhearted. Isn't that beautiful? My friends, Jesus lived the perfect example for us, and He calls each one of us as His disciples to follow Him. Jesus' life and teachings administered the antidote against sin, which is the gospel. And Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom, and He then invites His disciples and each one of us to do the same. So let's finish our little table here, even though it's colliding with one another. I'm going to read verse 6 first of Luke chapter 9, because it fits into our little table so much. It says, So they, the disciples, departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. And He gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. Let's put that in our table. All right? It says, they went through the towns preaching the gospel. Can you see the parallel between what God did in Eden, what Jesus did, and what Jesus asked the disciples to do? Preach the gospel. Preach the good news. My friends, when that man was leaning over that that police car in his drunken stupor, crying like a a little out-of-control child, He needed the good news. He needed to know that whatever led him up to that point, God can relieve him right there and then. Jesus Christ died for his sins. His past can be his past. And in that moment, he can be readopted as a son of God into God's presence. That is good news. So I'm asking you something this morning. Are you living the gospel? Do you even know what the gospel is? Are you excited to when you make a mistake or you fall down, do you understand what God is saying to you? I will put enmity between you. I will heal you. I will empower you. I forgive you. I will cleanse you. I will do everything for you. Do you understand that? Or are we living a gospel of works where we've got to try harder and when we fall once, we've got to go back and then next time we just grit our teeth and we do it better than we did before. Kind of like, I'm going to do my best and God will do the rest. That's not the gospel. The gospel is that God does everything to the one who gives him permission to do so. Giving God permission 
can be the hardest thing for a human being to do. But everything else is God's work. The next thing Jesus did is He gave them power and authority over demons. And I just loved our head elder's prayer this morning. She prayed a prayer with authority over the enemy. She bruised his head in that prayer. And my friends, you can see God did it. Jesus did it in his ministry and he's calling us to do the same thing. That we need to rebuke spirits of division. We need to rebuke spirits of lust. We need to rebuke spirits of gluttony. We need to rebuke all the spirits that assail us on a daily basis. Just like Jesus said, it is written, thou shalt, and then he quotes scripture and he says, get thee behind me, Satan. Spirits of worthlessness, spirits of addiction, spirits of, of self-pity. Get thee behind me. Because he gave his disciples, and you and I are his disciples, he gave them authority over the demons and the spirits. And it's time that the church of God takes that back. And finally, he releases. He commissioned his disciples to relieve the effect of sin by sending them to heal the sick and to minister to the needs of the people. The antidote against sin. The good news, the encouragement, the inspiration. It's not hopeless. God has provided a way. Authority over the demons. Get thee behind me. And then ministering to the poor the sick, the naked, the imprisoned men. The gospel is the antidote against sin. Not my works, not my doctrines, not my standards, not anything of mine. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is the antidote against sin. I love this. Whew. Take a deep breath and just read this with me. Christ's death and resurrection have opened before every soul an unlimited source of power from which to draw. This power will enable you to overcome the most objectionable traits in your character. God's supply of grace is awaiting the demand of every sin-sick soul. It will heal every spiritual disease. Do you believe that? What gives us unlimited power? Christ's death and resurrection. What enables us to overcome? It's God's supply of grace, my brother and sister. God's grace Everything that's in that heavenly treasure chest is there for you. That is what overcomes. Not you gritting your teeth and trying harder and harder and harder. That's not the end. By it, what is that? God's grace. By it, hearts may be cleansed from all defilement. I want to hear you. Read it with me. It is the gospel remedy for the curse of sin. It unites human beings with Christ in the performance of good works, enabling them to run the path of obedience, representing to the world the meekness and loneliness they have learned from the Savior. It is the gospel remedy for the curse of sin. What is the antidote of sin? The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm so tired of people belittling the grace of God. I'm so tired of people belittling, oh, that pastor is just preaching about the gospel again. My friends, the gospel is the power of God for the salvation of mankind. 
And the enemy wants to come in with these little sinister twists and get us to focus on all kinds of other things except the life, death, resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and the grace that He gives through His eternal, unconditional love. Where's our focus? Where is our focus as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? Do we want to make ourselves ready for the second coming by studying the doctrines more and more? Do we want to raise the church standards? Do we want to make sure that we witness at least to one person every day? Do we want to improve our behavior? Are we the guardians of the church to keep the church pure? Is that what our focus is? These are all good things, but they can't be our primary focus. And God in His mercy will, at the right time, in the right place, cause our focus to go there, but it doesn't stay there. Where does it stay? If I, go, if I came to that drunk man on, on the hood of the police car, and I started having a discussion with him about the seventh day Sabbath, what do you think he would say to me? And if I had to say to him, sir, your clothing is a little appropriate right now, what do you think he would say to me? My friends, the gospel is first and foremost. It is what gives people hope. It's what motivates people. It's what drives people. It's what heals people. The power of God is what changes us, each one in a different place and a different time. The gospel is what opens up the way for the indwelling of, our, of God's Spirit in each one of us. And from thence comes the power. From thence comes the power. The gospel, God's grace, provides unlimited power through which to overcome. It cleanses the heart from defilement. It enables believers to walk in the path of obedience. You know, <laughs> we all seem to think that the gospel is in the New Testament, don't we? If you put on the right spectacles and you read through the Old Testament... Chapters like Ezekiel 36 of the Valley of the Dry Bones. And here, Numbers chapter 21, you see the gospel so pure and so beautiful. Let's read through it quickly. Um, Numbers chapter 21, verse 46, it says, Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our souls loathe this worthless bread. Meanwhile, just a few chapters before, water came gushing out of a rock, right? And so the Lord sent fiery serpents amongst the people. And when a Hebrew writes, he always writes as if God is directly responsible for it. But God withheld His blessing from those complaining people. There were already serpents in the wilderness, right? But God's protection and God's blessing was just not with the complaining, rebellious people. And many of the people of Israel died, and, and, the, and the serpents bit the people. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you, Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten, then when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and he put it on a pole. And so it was, if a serpent had bitten everyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Power of the gospel? He looked and he lived. 
My friends, where we look, where we focus, can be the, the difference between life and death. You see, my friends, as Moses put up that serpent in the wilderness and people looked up, they saw the symbol of the pure, spotless Lamb of God becoming sin for each one of us. They looked at the symbol. The snake on a pole, Jesus became sin for you. Jesus became sin for me. They looked up at that, and as they looked, that antidote was administered to them immediately, and they lived in the same way as Adam and Eve were infected by that poison. And God gave them the good news. I will put enmity between them. You will bruise his head. And he ministered to their needs right there. In the same way, Jesus' whole ministry was focused on showing us the love and the character of God. Our own uselessness to do anything by ourselves. But the power of God to come and dwell in sinful flesh as the blood of Christ cleanses us. What a beautiful message. And today, we ask ourselves the question, are you looking and living? What is the first thing that comes into your mind when you're in a difficult situation at work? What is the first thing that comes into your mind when there's conflict between you and another person? What's the first thing that comes into your mind when you can't pay the bills? Where are you looking? As we were talking in the New Beginnings class this morning, I was sharing with a group that I was facing some discouragement. You know, and the thought just popped into my head. Dude, you're preaching the sermon in just a few minutes about looking at the Lord Jesus Christ. Here you are looking at your situation again. My friends, if we are so focused on the gospel, if we are so focused on exactly what Jesus Christ did for us, who he is, who he makes us through his blood, what he calls us to do. Here he's calling us to continue administering the antidote against sin. And we're busy arguing about different doctrines. We're just arguing about different things that's going on in the church, the color of the carpet, who's painting, who's not painting, all those things. Our focus is completely dis diverted from the pure, spotless Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We are instructed that we should be spending a thoughtful hour a day on the death, resurrection, on the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. Go study the teachings of Jesus Christ and see how often he teaches divisive doctrines and how often he teaches the gospel of the kingdom. How often he teaches this antidote against sin. Because my friends, once we have the antidote against sin, once we have the gospel straight, we will understand what the Spirit is saying to us about the truth and the teachings of the Bible and the doctrines of the Lord Jesus Christ and the difference between truth and error as, as close as they come at times. Because the enemy likes to twist truth in a very subtle and sinister way, but we can't do that by intellectual assent. We can't do that by going to school a little longer or digging deeper without the Spirit of God. Looking at the gospel heals us. Looking at God's gift of Jesus who became sin, of us, sin for us. Looking at Satan's defeat looking at God's complete provision and long-suffering and Christ's life as an example of ministering to the needs in the midst of these horrific effects of sin that's caused poverty, sickness, addiction, divorce, crime, separation. I love the theme that goes through Scripture and I don't have time to exhaust fully, share it with you. But look in Psalms 91 what it says. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent. You shall trample underfoot. 
That's the power of the gospel. Luke 10 verse 19, Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Do you believe that today? Do you believe that today? My friends, the gospel gives that power to us by the blood of Christ. If you look to yourself, yes, and this is me this morning, if you look to yourself, you will see only weakness. There is no Savior there. You will find Jesus, you will find Jesus away from yourself. You must look to Him and live. Look to Him who became sin for us, that we might be cleansed from sin and receive Christ's righteousness. I quoted this scripture last in the last session, but I want to do it again. Read it with me. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. What teaches us to say no to ungodliness? The grace of God. The grace of God. And I hope this morning that you've seen this, this progression from creation. How God gave us those three components, the antidote. My friends... If we use anything else as the antidote against sin, we're going to stay infected. We've got to use the beautiful gospel that was given to us as the antidote against sin. Arguing our doctrines to people is not the antidote against sin. Conforming to a set of rules is not the antidote against sin. Trying harder and being more disciplined is not the antidote against sin. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is the antidote against sin. Amen. Study that. Research that. Focus on that. And you will find the power. It is the three angels' message in verity. There was a man by the name of Harry Tonsing, an avid hiker, in South Africa, and they were hiking in the Drakensberg Mountains. And Harry was just a little bit close to the edge of the path. And he felt, as he was walking along, he suddenly felt a fiery burn in his ankle. And as he looked round, he saw one of the South African puff adders locked onto his heel. He kicked it off, it slipped away into the brush, but he knew what it was and he called out to the rest of the party, help me. Well, they knew what to do. They laid him down and kept him very still. Two of the hikers ran down and called the game rangers. The game rangers alerted the Air Force because they knew someone up in the mountains would not be able to get down to the hospital on time. There was a storm brewing. The South African Air Force knew the urgency of their matter, and they navigated their, their way through the storm clouds, and they picked Harry up, and they rushed him to the hospital, and his life was saved, because they knew the urgency of what that snake bite meant. My friends, the enemy is lying to you about the veracity and the fatality of his venom. We fall into a drunken stupor as to the urgency of the enemy's lies. And it's only by swift action and by having that urgency motivate us to make looking 
at that bronze serpent first thing in the morning, that we will be saved from that venom. Focusing on the life and teachings, the death and resurrection and the priestly intercession of the Lord Jesus Christ for each of us. What are you focusing on this morning? We need God's spirit to open our eyes like never before. We need the urgency and we need to just start each day with renewed focus. We sing the little tune, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. And it just kind of goes right over this veneer of denial and lethargy. This morning I pray that God evokes an urgency in your heart. to use the antidote that he provided against this horrific infection called sin. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, this morning this message is for me. And I'm praying, Father, that you will give me that urgency to keep the focus on the antidote that you provided. Father in heaven, we can so easily become engulfed in long-standing Christian teaching that we forget the gospel of Christ and what it means to us individually and personally. My friends, this morning I'm just going to pray that the Holy Spirit reveals to you what you've been focusing on. Where you've been turning for the antidote. Father in heaven, reveal to us. Make it clear. Cut away the cataracts from our eyes. The spiritual cataracts so we can see clearly. And if you in the quietness of this morning hour, just want to raise up your hand and say, I want to look. I want to look at this, this cross that was raised up and I want to live. If you want to just raise up your hand and say, Lord, redirect my focus this morning to the very thing that will save me. Just do that right now. Praise God. Praise God. And my hand is up with you, dear brother and sister, because I have a sinful nature too, and I allow myself to look at all the things that the enemy throws at me to distract me. So Father, today as a congregation, we commit ourselves to look up at the spotless Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Oh Father, may we have that focus every minute of the day. May the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ change us. May it motivate our behavior. May it make us excited, positive, energetic Christians willing to take on everything that was, all the gifts that have been passed on to us through the gospel of Christ. So that we can be the loving, lovable Christians that will win people like my drunk friend to the kingdom of God is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen.